uh, chapter 3 and verses uh, 14 to 18 is where we're eventually going to end up tonight. That's going to be the very end tonight. We have a little bit of working uh, to get to that point. Moving to a new state is sometimes really fun. This is my first winter in Colorado, and uh, I had never seen so much snow in my entire life. And when I got to Colorado, I thought, you know, generally I can figure things out for a new state. You find new places to eat, and that's fun, and you make new friends, and that's fun. But along with that, you have to experience some things to understand how to adjust to some things. And so I bought a snow shovel after it was too late um, so I could dig my truck out uh, of the snow that morning. I, I didn't go to work. It was negative 20 degrees. And I remember that specifically because I was wondering what I was doing in a job working outside in the winter. So you'll move to a new state. You learn some new things. You make some adjustments along the way. You can make some preparations sort of before you get there. Uh, but a lot of that learning of how to live in Colorado came from actually learning there. Going to a different country, though, is a little bit different. This is, uh, this is uh, Santa Maria, Ecuador, off the Rio Cayapas, the, the Cayapas River. And I was privileged to go here for two years in a row. This is my first year here. And this is about what I was expecting to see based on what people had shared with me about what the villages along the river in the jungle looked like. And going here my first year, I, I knew almost nothing. And I was relying on a lot of people to get around and, and to communicate for me and tell me what was culturally appropriate, uh, what was offensive, um, and some of the things that I should expect to see and luxuries I should uh, get ready to live without, like a bathroom and things like that. And in this picture here, you have three gentlemen here, and sitting in the chair there is a young man that's, he's, he's only known the jungle. He's only known the river. He was born there, raised there, will live there probably for the rest of his life. And there in the yellow shirt there, in the middle yellow-orange shirt, is our brother Kent Markham. And Kent Markham started a mission on this river where he went down and he would evangelize and he would bring uh, Ecuadorian natives with him and they would help evangelize along this whole river. And then they started establishing churches here and there. And so as Kent spent more time in Ecuador, he was forced to learn the language. And so he was better able to communicate instead of having a translator. He is now becoming the translator for uh, our brother Silas there that's in red. And, and Silas got to go there temporarily for a few weeks when I was there. And he's right now teaching Bible class on Sunday morning. You can definitely tell there's a, a, a dress code of the North American people <laughs> will really make you stand out from the locals there. And in this picture here, this last one, this one is in uh, Santo Domingo, Ecuador. And this is Sunday morning service. And on that left picture there, you have me. And, and I got the privilege of preaching uh, a Sunday morning lesson in Ecuador in a church. And my Spanish was almost nil. Um, and so our brother that's standing on the other side of the lectern there is Carlos. And this is his hometown. This is his home congregation. And he's doing the translating for me here. This was the second year in this picture. This is the second year that I got to go. And so I had some previous exposure to what it was like to be in this area the first time. And so before I got to go the second time here, I started to make some preparations for what it was going to be like in this new country, again, newish to me, again. And one of the first things that I really wanted to do was learn the language. And I didn't do so well at that, but I, I, could, I could ask for a few more things than I could the first time. Learning the language was really important. I was much more comfortable with communicating with people and trying to figure things out with people and approaching uh, some people that, that at first, when I was there, I was kind of scared to. But for me, as a temporary, uh, uh, on a temporary mission in this time, 
I knew that I had a limited time to really enjoy what I was going to be able to do with our brother Carlos here and with Silas and with Kent over on, on the river in that last picture there. And so I was preparing all that I could to spend a short amount of time there, just like our brother Silas here. Uh, he was prepared to spend a little bit longer of a time. His parents were going to stay on a full-time mission, and he was going to stay for an extended time with them. And so he even more was trying to be more prepared to stay in this country. And then Kent has spent so much time there that he's completely familiar with everything. He puts him there, or he goes there, and it's like, it's it's just home to him. He's used to living in this country now. He knows the language well, he knows the culture, he knows the geography and everything about it. Between the three degrees of people that you have there, between me and Silas and, and Kent there, you have people that know that they're going somewhere temporarily, and then you have somebody that's prepared to be there long term. But unlike our brother Carlos here that's doing the translating for me, He's only ever known Santo Domingo and the river as an evangelist. And it would be really interesting for him to hear that where he grew up here in Ecuador was not going to be the place where he was going to stay forever. If he was told from a very young age, Carlos, you're only going to be here for a few years, and then you're going to spend the rest of your life in a totally different country. You're going to spend your life somewhere completely different, new language, new people, new culture. And if Carlos knew that, then he would probably do what kids started to do and prepare for that journey. He would probably start learning the language, learning the culture, learning what's socially acceptable to be ready to live full time in a brand new place. This would really spark that idea that that his place in Ecuador is temporary. Carlos didn't do that, though. He got to stay there full time. And so tonight, we're going to look at a very uh, basic concept that, that we should understand, and that is our life as pilgrims, and understanding that where we are, though we are born on this earth, though we are born of humanity, and this is completely familiar to us, we're pilgrims here looking forward to an eternal home beyond this realm. What do we do to get ready to go to a place that we haven't been to yet, but we are told all about? In Hebrews chapter 11, Hebrews chapter 11, we use this passage, the Hall of Faith. And the author of Hebrews is giving all of these accounts of people that moved by faith. They had faith and it put them to action and what they were being told they believed, and so they moved toward what they were being told to do. And in Hebrews chapter 11, if you look over here in verse 8, it says, By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to a place that he was to receive as an inheritance. And he went out not knowing where he was going. By faith, he went to live in the land of promise as in a foreign land, living in tents, with Isaac and Jacob and heirs with him of the same promise. And we can revisit this story all the way back in Genesis and see that even though Abraham didn't know all of the details about where he was going, he was faithful enough to go and put his mind to go to the place where God told him he was going to go. So faithful that he left his family, he left his nation, he left just about everything except for his wife, Lot, their servants, they packed the things that they probably needed for this journey, making on their way. And along their journey, even though Abraham has left everything that seems most important, God gave him even more provision for him later on. He gave him everything that he was going to need for this. In Genesis chapter 6, verses 14 to 22, actually, if you look back earlier, if we just take a peek at, at Noah as an Old Testament man that knew that there was going to be something beyond the ark, in this little snippet here of Genesis chapter 6, 14 to 22, God is giving Noah instructions of how to build the ark. And his instructions aren't outlandish. He's saying, you're going to build this out of gopher wood, and God provides all of this wood and all of the means that Noah needs to accomplish this mission that God is putting him on. And Noah building this, knowing he's going to enter the ark and come out into a new place afterwards. And here in Genesis chapter 13, verses 1 through 6, this is that same idea that even though Abraham left his land and his family 
had only brought with him his immediate family, his wife, and some of their servants and their possessions. As they went along through the journey, having left a lot behind, God provided even more for them and puts them almost into a state of luxury at this time as he's going on to his journey to this new land. In fact, God makes him so wealthy that Lot's servants and Abraham's servants start to bicker with each other because there's just too much between the two of them, and they need to go separate ways to try to manage this issue that they're having before them. And in all of that, you can see that the old pilgrims of the Old Testament are being brought up here in Hebrews, and the author of Hebrews is capitalizing on this idea of faith when people are told to do something that they put into action and that they move. And so you have Abraham, a pilgrim, when he was told to go somewhere, he went there. God gave him more than enough provision to get there. God gave him the direction of what he needed to do, and Abraham went. And so our Hebrew author if I read it again, sums up many chapters like this. By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to a place that he was to receive as an inheritance, and he went out. Not knowing where he was going, by faith, he went to the live in the land of promise, as in a foreign land, living in tents with Isaac and Jacob, heirs with him of the same promise. They went out, though, knowing that what they had in their location was going to be temporary. Not going to some place and finding it um, uh, fulfilling to, to settle halfway there and establish a great kingdom, but continuing to live in tents, living in temporary shelters. They had an understanding that where they were at the moment was going to be temporary, and God was continuing to lead them but they continue to look forward to faith. Not only Abraham as a pilgrim here, but if you look down the generation, Joseph kind of picks up the same idea. Joseph, who was sold into Egypt by his brothers, comes into a very prosperous position by God's granting and lives there, and his sons and his brothers are there. And as Joseph is getting ready to die, he communicates in, in Hebrews eleven twenty two 22, uh, says this about Joseph. By faith, Joseph, at the end of his life, made mention of the exodus, the exodus of the Israelites, and gave directions concerning his bones. And you go back and you trace that in Genesis chapter 50, verse 25, and it's clear as day that Joseph, even in his position where he was, was saying, this is not the end. This isn't where we are trying to get to. This is just where we are right now. And God has a promise and a provision. And so I'm giving you instructions for my bones for when God takes you out of this place and puts you in the next place, the next place that he's promised. And more than that, if we peek back a few verses in Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 13, these all died in faith, not having received the things promised, but having seen them and greeted them from afar and having acknowledged that they were strangers and exiles on the earth. For people who speak thus make it clear that they are seeking a homeland. But if they had been thinking of that land from which they had gone out, they would have had opportunity to return. But as it is, they desire a better country. That is a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared for them a city. The author of Hebrews, as he's writing in the New Testament, is bringing up all these Old Testament pilgrims that understood the situation that they were in as pilgrims, looking forward to a better place, a place that God was going to give them and provide for them all the way along the place, all the way along the way until they got to the place, and then also knowing their situation, their time, is just completely temporary. And the New Testament Hebrew writer is capitalizing on an Old Testament story to teach new Christians. The New Testament often used Old Testament people to teach the concepts that they needed to know right then. 
And so a New Testament writer is saying, look at the old stories and see what God did for the pilgrims and learn from that. And among these, Jesus would bring up Solomon as an Old Testament reference. He would bring up Jonah, an Old Testament reference to teach a new idea. Noah, bringing up an Old Testament man that he would have known to communicate something that they would understand, something they were familiar with from the Old Testament to communicate who he was. And then in 2 Peter, as we'll eventually get there, Peter is doing the same thing to communicate with an Old Testament understanding, historical understanding, something that you need to understand right now. And with all of that, the first century Christians would understand what it was like to have to live a pilgrim in a sojourning mind and life based on what their ancestors had done who knew God. And so the new first century Christians are understanding we must be living a temporary life, looking forward to something better. And all this time, God must be providing for us. If you look at the Old Testament and the New Testament teachings, you can clearly see how both things are communicated. Psalm 144, verse 4, man is like a breath. His days like a passing shadow. James 4, 14, yet you do not know what tomorrow will bring. What is your life? For you are a mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes. You look in the Old Testament, you look at the first century Christians, they're getting the picture. Life is short. Daniel 7, 14, Daniel records from what was given to him. And to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away. And his kingdom, one that shall not be destroyed. Daniel communicating an eternal kingdom of an eternal God. And you peek forward into Paul writing in 2 Corinthians 4, 17 to 18. For this light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. As we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen, eternal. Daniel communicating, there's an eternal heavenly kingdom with a God that reigns forever and ever and ever. Paul saying, our life down here, light affliction, momentary, not even worth being compared to what is beautiful and beyond and the eternal glory that's beyond. What we see, temporary affliction. The best things, unseen because they're eternal. Psalm 90, verse 12, the psalmist writes, So teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. And Ephesians 5, 15 to 16, Look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of the time, because the days are evil, both an Old Testament and a New Testament understanding that you have a short time on earth, make the most of it. The Old Testament principles are taught in the New Testament to first century Christians. And now today we use both the Old Testament and the New Testament to understand what is our life as Christians today? What are the things that we've learned from both covenants that we apply to our lives as modern day Christians? Life is short as but a vapor. I understand that. There's an eternal place for us to go. So what's down here must be real temporary. We have a limited number of days. So let's not waste them. Especially if we understand we're going to somewhere with so much glory. We are but pilgrims. What are we doing with our time as pilgrims to prepare to be in the eternal place? First Peter chapter 2, verse 11 and 12. Peter communicating in his time 
Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh which wage war against your soul. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. Paul communicating to people in his time, also communicating to us in our time. Sojourners, exiles, and a proper way to live knowing that God is just on the horizon. The time to see God is just on the horizon. And so if there's anything for us to learn from the Old Testament and the New Testament about being a Christian, is that we are pilgrims and sojourners, and what that means for us as pilgrims and sojourners is to prepare for a future time and a future life and an eternal glory. Staying in First Peter, but going over to chapter 4 and verse 7. First Peter chapter 4 and verse 7, the end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be self-controlled and sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. Above all, keep loving one another earnestly, since love covers a multitude of sins. Show hospitality to one another without grumbling. As each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's very grace. Whoever speaks as one who speaks of oracles of God, whoever serves as one who serves by the strength that God supplies, in order that everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. To him belong glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. There's a whole package wrapped up in just a few verses. God is just on his way. He's just at hand. What does that mean for your life if you know that God is just on the other side and on his way? You live a life that reflects him, service, love, hospitality. What God has given you, what God has supplied you, what he's given you, you get to use. And everything here is just temporary. Peter wraps it all up in just a few verses. But he's able to communicate that with a, you got to think about the future. If you're going to think about how your life is to be lived right now. Just over our, in his next letter, he then talks about people that have thrown all of that out of way. You want to know how to just throw all of your faith out and be frustrated with it is to stop focusing on the future and stop preparing for what God has promised. Second Peter chapter three, this is now the second letter that I'm writing to you, beloved. In both of them, I am stirring up your sincere mind by way of reminder that you should remember the predictions of the holy prophets and the commandment of the Lord and Savior through your apostles, knowing that, first of all, the scoffers will come in the last days with scoffing, following their own sinful desires. They will say, where is the promise of the coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all things are continuing as they were from the beginning of creation. For they deliberately overlooked the fact that the heavens existed long ago, and the earth was formed out of water and through water by the word of God, and that by means of all these the world existed and deluged with water and perished. By the same word, the heavens and earth that now exist are stored up for the fire, being kept until the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. You want to stop focusing on the future, you just get rid of everything that God has done in the past. Forget how he's worked with the fathers. Forget how he's worked in the creation. You could even forget all of the salvation and all of his promises if 
if you just want to stop thinking about what do I need to do to get ready to be prepared for the land that's beyond and throw all of that away. Suddenly understanding that life is short gets thrown out and you do what I want to do when I want to do it, however I want to do it. Whatever makes me happy right now is just what I'll focus on for now, not thinking that there is something better beyond the horizon. Actually, Peter continues to remind them against this principle to keep them on a focused mind. Earlier in chapter 4, chapter 4 and verse 3 says this, For the time that is past suffices for doing what the Gentiles want to do, living in sensuality, passions, drunkenness, orgies, drinking parties, lawless idolatry. But with respect to all of this, they are surprised when you do not join them in the same flood of debauchery, and they malign you. But they will give account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. People will wonder and will notice that you're different when you are future and you're heavenly focused. Because you're not doing the temporary things. You're getting prepared for the eternal things. So like moving to a brand new country, like moving to a new place and making preparations for that, so that when you get there, it seems like you fit right in and you completely understand. So the Christian prepares for the eternal life. And then their life looks like they completely fit into heaven already. Their language is only love. Their actions, they don't reflect the earthly, worldly actions. They reflect the heavenly actions. Their demeanor, it's almost like they don't even belong in the world anymore. Because they're already prepared to live in the eternal place beyond. That's what it's like to understand being a sojourner and a pilgrim in this life. There's not time to focus on anything that's going to take away from the beauty and the glory of living an eternal life. No divisions to be had. And so we get to the end of Peter, our scripture reading. And 2 Peter, when Peter brings it all together, 2 Peter, I'm going to start in verse 8. Do not overlook this one fact, beloved, that the Lord one day, to the Lord, excuse me, that with the Lord, one day is as a thousand years and a thousand years is one day. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish but that all should reach repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, and then the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved, and the earth and the works that are done on it will be exposed. Since all these things are thus to be dissolved, what sort of people ought you to be in lives of holiness? And godliness. Knowing all this, what kind of people are you going to be as pilgrims? When I was young and uh, my family attended 
Vermont Street Church of Christ in Albuquerque, New Mexico. And we lived in our house on the west side of Albuquerque, Cactus Hills Place. My dad had this routine where he always seemed to be the first one that was ready to go to church on Sunday morning. And we had about a 30 to 35 minute drive to get across town. And so what he would do is he would go to the garage and he would stand at the garage door and he would call everybody from the garage door to come and get to the car. And the way he specifically called me and my sisters is he would just say all three of our names as fast as he could. Brooks over town. Brooks over town, let's go, is what he would yell throughout the house over and over and over again. Until all three of us were there. And when we heard the first call, that was the time where you were trying to lace up your shoe and you were running down the hall and I was bumping into my sister to try to get to the car because I knew what was expected of me that I needed to be ready to go to church. I knew uh, that I needed to get into the car and dad was already there. And so I better be ready to present myself as a church going son to my dad at four years old to be ready to get into my car seat to go to church. There was no wondering where we were going or what we were doing on Sunday mornings, especially when dad was calling all three of us from the garage door. We knew exactly what was expected of us. So it should be when our Heavenly Father calls us home that we know exactly what is expected of us when it is time to go. And so when it's time to go, in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 12, waiting for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be set on fire and dissolved, and the heavenly bodies will melt as they burn. But according to his promise, we are waiting for new heavens and new earth in which righteousness dwells. Therefore, beloved, since you are waiting for these, be diligent to be found by him without spot or blemish and at peace and count the patience of the Lord as salvation, just as our beloved, Paul, uh, excuse me, our beloved brother Paul also wrote to you according to the wisdom given him. You know exactly what's expected of you. You know exactly what it is to be ready to go. Verse 17, you therefore, beloved, knowing this beforehand, take care that you are not carried away with these error of lawless people and lose your own stability, but grow in the grace of the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be the glory both now and to the day of eternity. Amen. We have a lot going on in the world right now and in our own lives. But everything that's going on right now is but temporary. When Joseph was in Egypt, he understood where I am and the political situation right now as me as the ruler or me as a prisoner. God has already established his plan, and I know that we are going from here to a place. Whatever situation we are under right now as Christians, we understand is temporary. We keep our focus, understanding that God is taking us to an eternal and a promised place. We understand that our life is short and temporary, so we take advantage of that temporary time, redeeming the time, as it says in Ephesians. Redeem the time to make sure that you're ready to go. And make sure your brother and your sister is ready to go. We know what sort of people we ought to be as pilgrims and sojourners. If you're not ready to go, it's time to get ready to go. Like a thief in the night. The lesson is yours this evening. If you need to be baptized, now is that time. You could be washed and all your sins will be covered, and then you will truly be ready to go. Once you let your need be known, as we sing, this world is not my home. This world is not my home, I'm just a passing through. My treasures are laid up, someday beyond the blue. 
The angels beckon me from heaven's open door, and I can't be at home in this world anymore. Oh Lord, you know I have a friend like you. If heaven's not my home, then Lord, what will I do? The angels beckon me from heaven's open door, and I can't be at home in this world anymore. They're all expecting me, and that's one thing I know. Savior, pardon me, and now I am I know he's really true, though I am big and poor, and I can't be at home in this world anymore. Oh Lord, you know I have no friend like you. If heaven's not my home, then Lord, what will I do? The angels beckon me from heaven's open door, and I can't be at home in this world anymore. Just up in glory land, we'll live eternally. The saints on every hand are shouting victory. Their songs are sweet as praise, bring back from heaven shore, and I can't be at home in this world anymore. Oh Lord, you know I have no friend like you. If heaven's not my home, then Lord, what will I do? The angels beckon me from heaven's open door. And I can't be at home in this world anymore. Thank you, Kellen. Good job. Christians are kind of like time travelers. We're three dimensional. Got a foot in the past and foot in the future, which influences our present. Just kind of a recap of, of those three points. Appreciate that. Um, Owen gave me a box full of L.A. Mott books. L.A. Mott was a, a preacher, died just a few years ago, but he was still alive when Andre and I got married. He lived in the Jacksonville, Florida area where she was temporarily living. And uh, in fact, his son, daughter-in-law, were in the congregation where she was uh, worshiping. And good Bible student, put together a lot of little workbooks and studies on the Bible. I have a whole box of these things. I think I'm going to put several of them in the track rack. They're a little bit bigger than some of those slots, but uh, here's one, Baptism, Grace, and Justification. Used material that was in this one to help prepare for my debate a couple of years ago. Worth its weight in gold, so you might want to get this one. But uh, uh, anything that, that L.A. Mott writes is worth worth picking up and taking a read. So I will uh, make those available. If you want to grab a few tonight, you can, but otherwise I'll, I'll put them in the track rack gradually at least and uh, make those available. Lord willing, we'll see most of you on Wednesday evening, 7 o'clock, for another restoration lesson from the Old Testament. And um, let's go ahead and have a closing song and prayer. Oh, one more little detail. Um, Carl Brown got out of the hospital Friday. And so he's, he's back at home doing somewhat better. Uh, Paula Henry texted me after this morning's announcement. So I wanted to put footnote to We are born for Canaan land, standing by the way. Who shall lead us on the road? Choose your king today. Dead we stand like Joshua, dead to say the word. And